Hi everyone, my name is Moni. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Board Games, where we pretty much just review a few games at a time in one video. Yeah, yeah, we had plans to do actually our Gen Con uh, video where we're going to review yes. all the games, or a lot of the games that we played there. But we've been very, very busy lately, and yeah. we have some other games that we wanted to talk about, so we kind of cut this one in line. Yeah, first. well, reviewing takes a long time. Now, you have to play a game several times, and the thing is, we're leaving for a trip out of the country mm -hmm. in like... A week and a half. Like 10 or 11 days from now. Yeah, yeah. and we'll be gone for two and a half weeks. Our trip is basically going to culminate at Essen Spiel, which is one of the largest board game conventions in the world. So we're going to be uh, fortunate enough to attend that this year. Mm -hmm. But because of that, we've had to front film a lot of the content that we're going to be slowly releasing over the period of those two weeks. Yeah. So we've been extremely busy filming, uh, which means we haven't had the time to completely play all of those games yet enough to there. enough to like talk about them to yeah. a point where we're like okay we're we, we feel comfortable about these games yeah. we have one last game <laughs> we did yeah so we decided to just cut this video in because we do have a few games that we were able to play throughout the year actually mm -hmm. that we just hadn't had time to really talk about this episode is going to feature five different games and they're going to be of uh, different weights as well as different genres these are just really random random supply of games yeah we normally try to like uh Funnel it down to like some sort of similarity. This one is just not today. Five games, <laughs> random. Yeah. All right, shall we begin? Yes. Game number one. Game number one. Okay, this came in from uh, Blue Orange Games, and it's designed by two different designers, Johan Benvenuto as well as Alexandra Droit, mm. and it's a game called Downtown Farmers Market, the strategy game for savvy shoppers, and that's exactly oh. what it is. <laughs> uh, if you're familiar with Blue Orange Games, they make more kind of like family weight, accessible games, simple mm -hmm. rule sets, but kind of clever designs. Yes. Uh, and this is none other than one of those designs. Yeah. So like King Domino uh, mm -hmm. or Blue Lagoon, which is more of a strategic uh, game that they've published in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so with this game, one of the reasons why we were interested in it is because of the art style. You know, it's very, very cute. It's very simple, but really cute. Really nice. And so the way that the game works is inside this box, there are two different types of tiles. You have tiles that have different combinations of produce. So you'll see like like eggs or cheese, Milk, carrots, bread. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. And then the other type of tile are just all scoring criteria. So you'll see stuff like having exactly seven of the same type of produce will score you X number of points. Or you'll see um, specific combinations of produce, like having exactly three carrots and five bread or something will score you X number of points. And so the way that the game works is during setup, each player is handed four of these scoring mm -hmm. tiles and you basically choose which side of each of those tiles you want to use because they're double-sided. And then you arrange them in front of you to start your four by four grid. So you'll have four scoring tiles along one column, and then you'll you'll be handed another four tiles that you're going to then choose which sides to use mm -hmm. and then put them at the top of your four by four grid. Yeah. And these tiles are going to dictate all the ways in which you are going to score points in the game. Because the way that the actual game is played is you're basically just drafting the produce tiles from the center of the table. Uh, in a two-player game, there's a, a mechanic where uh, you also have to discard. <laughs> there's a little bit of hate drafting. There's a little hate basically. drafting in this game, for sure. Yeah, and so it, it, it almost feels like a Calico Light. So if you've ever played a game like Calico before, where you're basically trying to constantly meet the demands of your scoring criteria the entire game by trying to make a perfect you know, a playing area that, that'll meet the scoring tiles of both the row and the column that that tile is going to be placed in. Yeah. Because each placement in your 4x4 grid is going to be playing towards two different scoring tiles, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because right? you've set yourself up uh, going, you know, in the horizontal direction and in the vertical direction. Yes. Two completely different scoring tiles. So you might find yourself, as the game progresses, drafting tiles, and now you're forced to put something in. Maybe you have to put something in a row that says, yeah. this row cannot have milk and it's the only place that this tile that you're left with to draft is like right i guess i'm not going to score this but okay by me putting this here i'm going to min max and get some points out of this over here so yeah, the, yeah. uh yeah. being very aware as to what your opponents are looking to score and what tiles you're leaving behind for mm -hmm. them becomes very very important at about i would say the third to halfway point of the game because mm -hmm. you're like Okay, Monique needs more milk and corn. This <laughs> tile is exactly a milk corn t a tile. It's really can't funny. let her have that. So uh, yeah, it, it gets uh, it gets a little bit mean. It can be a little bit mean, but it's also very clever and a very simple design. The dialogue during the game is pretty funny mm -hmm. because you're basically just talking about eggs and cheese and milk and stuff like that. Yeah. But the uh, thinkiness of it is is quite high. It very it definitely feels like calico light. Yeah, because you're going to want to try to score everything, just like in that game, if you are familiar with it, uh, because obviously you have, you know, four scoring criteria one way, four the other. So there's yeah. eight different things you're going to try to score. I don't think we've ever had it where anybody has scored eight. 
Uh, we've played this game several times, and nobody has ever scored oh, all, all of them. Oh, all eight of your score You no. always, like, mess you're something up. To. Yeah, you're not going to. Yeah. Uh, just because of the way that the kind of the flow of the game goes. Yeah. But the game is really fast. Uh, it's it's really light. It's just I mean, 16 this rounds. Is like you just draft 16 tiles. 20 minutes. It yeah. says 20 minutes on the box, and that's about right. If mm -hmm. you have a younger players around the table, there is a family variant to this, so that you don't, it doesn't have to be that mathy, that thinky, or that mean, I think. Mm. We haven't played that variant, so we can't really speak on it. But I quite enjoy this game. I I really, really like it. Like yeah. this is gonna stay in our collection just because of how e how small this package is and, and the amount of thinkiness and, and crunchiness to it in such a small package, right? Yeah, this thing uh this thing looks like it travels pretty well. Um it doesn't take up too much table space once you like know your four by four grid. Yeah. So uh, we've played this at pretty much all player counts mm -hmm. and all all the player accounts we've enjoyed. Um, so this might even end up going with us to Essen, I think, because yeah, it's maybe. light enough uh, to play with our family as well. And so anyway, that is Downtown Farmer's Market. I hope this game is out. I think it is. I think it it's, might be. It's one of the newer releases not, uh, yeah. with Blue Orange. But it's small, it's cute, but it's crunchy. And uh, yeah, I really like yeah, it. Yeah, we like it. All right, next up we have another small box game. And it actually has a very similar theme. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm not realizing. Um, this is Point Salad. It's a game published by AEG as well as Flat Out Games, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's designed by three designers. We have Molly Johnson, Robert Melvin, as well as Sean Senkovich. And so in this game, you are basically trying to, I think you're trying to make a salad. Yeah, you're trying right? to curate your own scoring criteria by drafting these different uh, vegetable cards mm -hmm. or drafting different scoring criteria and trying to basically score the most Meat. points in a yeah. point salad. So it's a very similar in, in the way that like downtown farmers market sounds, but it plays very differently. Yeah. This time, instead of tiles, this game has a deck of cards. It's a card and game. Yeah. The cards are also double-sided. One side of the card has a vegetable on it, and the other side has a scoring criteria. And the scoring criteria is going to be stuff like one point per carrot, or five points if you have the most of a certain vegetable. Right. I don't know if that's exactly a, a scoring criteria, but mm. it sounded right. Right. <laughs> yes. Or 12 points for a complete set of vegetables. I think that's definitely that's a card. That's definitely a card, yeah. And so the way that the game works is you'll have vegetable cards laid out in a grid, and above them in three uh, draw decks, you'll have the opposite side of the card. So you'll have three draw decks of just the scoring criteria. And so on your turn, you can either take two vegetables or you can take one of the uh, scoring criteria cards from the top of one of those decks. Mm -hmm. If you take vegetable cards, they automatically refill from the draw decks that are above them, and they get when they refill, they get flipped to their vegetable side. Right, right. So those scoring criteria are no longer They're there. They're gone, yeah. Yeah, and so basically what you're trying to do is you're just trying to take scoring criteria, and you're trying to take vegetables that fit those scoring criteria. The problem with that is some of the scoring criteria don't want you to have a certain vegetables, it's like you want this vegetable, but not that. And so you're really trying to take the cards that you need and not take the ones that you don't need, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, you're going to find yourself possibly in like conflict where it's like, ah, uh, that scoring criteria is perfect, but uh, these cards are also perfect for the other scoring criteria I'm working towards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very light kind of uh, kind of experience. It plays up to six players, which is, yeah. uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and, I do like that. And the game just... Super easy to teach, uh, very easy to understand, and you can get it to you, the table. And you basically set this up. game up and you start playing. And you just go because yeah. it's so simple, but it's so like it, it's pretty clever. It is clever. Um, yeah. The very first time I played it, I thought, "Wow, this is a really novel concept. It's really, really clever. The game goes really quickly, which is both a good and a bad thing because if I'm like really eyeing something, well, it's gonna be gone, and you can't really time. Especially in a higher player account, you're like, gone. "Oh, that's a great scoring card for me," or "Oh, I need two tomatoes, and there, yeah. there, there they go. Nope, they're gone." So yeah. it's almost like sometimes you feel like you're just treading water. Yeah. Like the game is just going and going and you can't really plan for much, if you, especially in higher player accounts. Yeah. I will say, though, that uh, the more and more I play this, it, it definitely felt like it had diminishing returns. Like I, I enjoy it less and less every Same. time I play it. Because yeah. you have to play through the entire deck in all of them. I, you, you basically play until all the cards have been drafted. And that's what ends the game. And mm -hmm. so after a while, it's kind of like we are still taking Two cards. cabbage or one cabbage, one uh, purple cabbage. Yeah. Like that. yeah so it's you, almost like you get vegetable fatigue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's. I mean, for me, there's nothing really too exciting going on in the game. It's a, It's one of those ones that like I'm, I'm willing to play, but it's not like. I'm when like, you pull out. oh my gosh, point salad. Let's, let's <laughs> make sure we pack that when we go to game night kind of thing. Despite the fact that this has some diminishing returns for me, it hasn't stopped me from uh, ordering the EV version. <laughs> oh, because yeah. this has been rethemed in... A, a Pokemon run. I think in Korea for for Pokemon. Okay. And I'm a big Pokemon fan. <laughs> and so there's a there's an EV version of point salad. I thought that was pretty random, but also pretty cool. And so that's I had not that in yet. No, that we don't have it. Yeah. 
So there you go. That is our second game. It's another small box game. Point, Point solid. solid. All right, game number three. We are chugging along. Mm -hmm. So we have a Ticket to Ride game. We do. I don't know if we've ever uh, showcased physically a Ticket to Ride game on our channel before. We talked about it probably in our uh, games that got us into the hobby video that we did a little while back. I hope so. I think that's probably it. Because that's true. Yeah. If you're not familiar with Ticket to Ride, this is a hugely successful empire, right? Yeah. Board game empire. It's designed by uh, Alan Moon mm -hmm. and published by Days of Wonder. So there are a lot of versions of Ticket to Ride out there. I've actually only played the base game Ticket to Ride. Yeah, that's and right. And this one. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've played any other one. I've played New York uh, and, of course, the base one. Uh, and then this is very similar in, in the vein of the New York one, where it's mm. like a smaller map and um, kind of shorter routes to get things done. Now, Ticket to Ride really did bring us into the hobby. It was one of the games that really influenced us getting into a hobby board games. Oh, yeah. When we started playing Ticket to Ride, we played that game a lot. Mm -hmm. Like we would, we would pull that game out to introduce board games to people who don't play board games. That was always kind of like our our trick kind of under a sleeve, yeah. right? It is, yeah. It, yeah. And it's, it's good for that, it, totally. And so if you've never played Ticket to Ride before, this is basically a track laying game. It's all about trains, but really you're, you're turning in colors of cards to claim uh, colored routes on a map. That is the most basic way of explaining Ticket to Ride. And you can basically port that description to all the different Ticket to Rides. They all just have like little tweaks here and there that make it specific to that yeah, theme, right? at the very beginning of the game, you're going to have a couple cards that like say you need to connect this city to this city, and they're mm -hmm. typically a little bit further apart. And if you're able to do it at the end of the game, then you'll score X amount of points. Mm -hmm. And it's a big race to get to these routes because typically uh, only one person can uh, kind of claim or lay down their track. So if somebody's already taken over like one of those routes, now you got to go like kind of around, around and try yeah. to find your way there. But you're going to score points as you claim tracks. And so mm -hmm. depending um, on how long the yeah. routes are, right? Yeah, exactly. So. That is the heart and soul of Ticket to Ride. Uh, when we heard that they were releasing a San Francisco version, I was very curious because, again, I had only played the original game and I'm from San Francisco. So I really wanted to see the map and I wanted to know what was so special about this one. Mm -hmm. And so in this game, this is a much smaller version of Ticket to Ride. It plays much quicker as well. I think the box says the box says 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. So it's a really, really fast version of Ticket to Ride, two to four players. And it is a San Francisco map. It's beautiful. It has a lot of different uh, sites that if you're familiar with San Francisco that you'll recognize. Recognize. The big hits, the landmarks. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of cable car artwork because that's kind of like uh, iconic for San Francisco, even though a lot of people who live, who grew up in the area, never ride a cable car. You've ridden one. I've ridden one, yeah, but it's not, I mean, not you can use it as a transportation. You can use it as a form of transportation. It's just pretty inefficient yeah. <laughs> these days. And other than that, it pretty much plays like regular Ticket to Ride. There is a souvenir collecting mechanic mm -hmm. where you're basically just trying to set collect. If you're able to build a route that connects to one of these souvenir locations and you get one of those tokens, yep. and at the end of the game, depending on how many of those you have, um, you, you get a certain number X of points. amount of points, yeah. The more so, you have, it's kind of like that exponential scoring. So mm -hmm. it kind of encourages you not to only like score the routes that you need on your secret objectives, but also at the same time, try to race to get to these souvenirs so you can score at the end of the game. It's definitely going to call out to people who love San Francisco and love anything having to do with San Francisco because it's very, you know, very thematic in that sense. But it's definitely still a ticket to ride. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the fact that it's a very fast version of the game. And so people who really, really love this game might enjoy how quickly you can get in and out of it. I can't really speak on how it compares to the other version of Ticket to Ride that are also fast. Yeah, it, right? I mean, the New York one, from what I remember, it's been a couple of years now since I've played it. It's a smaller map. Uh, it's kind of like Manhattan. Um, and I don't think there was like a souvenirs aspect of that one like mm. this one does. Uh, but like it's just it's just smaller routes like threes and fours to, and twos and some a couple ones versus you know, regular Ticket to Ride, which has the longer, like, fives yeah. and sixes, I think. But if you don't care for Ticket to Ride, I don't think it's going to convince you to want to play it. Nothing will change your mind on no. that. Yeah. Okay, the fourth game we have is a couple years older. Um, I finally got to play it this year a handful of times at our local convention. Uh, it's a game that came out from BoardGameTables.com called QE. Yes. Uh, QE stands for Quantitative Easing, which is a, a governmental uh, economic policy where they basically pump money into different industries to kind of keep the economy afloat. Mm. Uh, this is a three to five player auction game designed by, I believe, Gavin Birdenbaum and also, again, published by BoardGameTables.com. That's right. This is a very unique type of auction game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's best played with higher player counts, in my opinion. Agreed. And the reason why it's unique, this is pretty, pretty much the thing that people say about the game the most, is you can bid whatever you want in this auction. Sky's yeah. the limit. You money can, is infinite. Money is infinite. Yeah. 
Because the way that it works is everybody is a representative of a certain nation. So maybe I'm the representative of Japan. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the game, we're going to be auctioning off these tokens. And the tokens basically represent different industries. So each token is going to have a base number of points on it. It's also going to belong to a nation, and it's going to have a specific industry. So it's right. all those three things. So it could be like Japanese agriculture or yes, something like that. for four points. Mm -hmm. And so whoever wins that token will get the base number of points that it shows on the token at the end of the game. In addition, we want to collect tokens that all belong to the nation that we represent. So if I represent Japan, I want all the tokens that have Japan on them because I'll get a bonus points for You'll that. You'll get more points than other people will for that. Yes. Yep. And I also want to collect uh, both the same type of industries as well as sets because you can score in both ways. So it's a big set collection game at the end of the day. But the, the way that the actual game works is each round, somebody is going to be the auctioneer. And that person is going to basically establish the minimum or the base bid. What actually, it's not even the base bid. It's what they are willing to pay right. for whatever token they're auctioning off. Right, right. And that's public information. That is, that's the one public information. Yeah. Then everybody else around the table is going to secret, secretly bid how much they are willing to pay for this token. Yeah, everybody gets like this little plastic uh, checkbook mm -hmm. and you basically write down secretly uh, with the dry erase marker how much you're willing to pay for that token and you'll slide it to the auctioneer. Yes. The auctioneer is going to collect all these checkbooks and know exactly who bid how much. They will be the only person to know who bid how much on a five-player mm -hmm. game. They'll know everything. Uh, and then essentially they're going to say, okay, the representative of Japan has won this auction. They'll slide everybody back their checkbooks and then they'll give that token off to whoever's representing Japan in that particular uh, example. Yes. The thing is, they're not going to reveal exactly how much was bid. All you know is that that person outbid everybody else. Yes. And so as you play the game, you have no idea how much people are spending. Right. And the reason why that's important is because at the very end of the game, whoever spends the most amount of money loses. Automatically. Automatically. Yeah. So you want to buy these tokens, but you don't want to spend the most money because you're going to lose no matter what. Mm -hmm. So it's this uh, weird balance of like not knowing how much people are spending, but also wanting to win these tiles. If you don't win these tiles, you're not going to win no matter what, because mm -hmm. you're not going to score any points. Yeah, the game right? does have a mechanism where I think twice you can, see, you can um, secretly look at what somebody has bid. I think it depends on player uh, it does account. Play, depend on player account. Yeah. For me, I think the game is it shines at five. I think it's only, for me, even though it says three to five players. I think I only like playing it at five players. Oh, I like the more chaos. I want all the nations in there, and yeah. I want more competition for all the different industries. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Definitely yeah. higher. I mean, the more players, the more enjoyable it is for me, mm -hmm. also. But uh, this is a very unique auction game. If you've never played this game before and you like auction games, I highly suggest you, you at least try it one day. Yeah. It's, not, it's definitely not going to be a hit for everyone. For me, it really depends on the group. It depends on the group, yes. and I, I can't really play it back to back in the same day, I notice. There's a little bit of decreasing, diminishing returns as well yeah, on this one. Yeah, this is one, like, it's it's nice. Like, you play it, you put it away, and then you play it again a couple months later, yeah. and it's like, ooh, this feels fresh yeah. again. And it's nice to have in our collection because of how unique it is yeah. and how everybody around the table kind of reacts to when they, especially the, when they play it for the first time. They're like, whoa, okay, so yeah. this is what this game is. It's really, it's really different. Especially right, at, right after the teach, a lot of people will be like, They'll have that like, oh, okay, like okay, I, I don't no idea quite what, know where it's like, perfect, could happen here. perfect, just, just <laughs> trust me, it'll be fine. It's also uh, very dependent on whoever bids first, I've noticed, because there have been a couple of times, because I typically tend to teach this game when we play it, and uh, I always end up being the first person to bid, and so I, I always have this like, oh, do, do we go in the millions? Like, what kind of a game is this going to be? Yeah. And I'm typically a more reserved bidder. Uh -huh. uh, I always lose auction games, and it's because I'm always too scared to bid. I'm always right. too scared to spend enough money. And in this game, we've learned you really want to spend the money. You do want to spend the money. You want yeah. to start to try to influence, like what, especially with those like secret tokens where people are like, "What did Naveen bid? Yeah, what the heck?" And then they see that and they're like, "Oh." This, I guess, becomes a new norm. And right. then, so then, like, sometimes you can then, like, force people to bid more uh, than they wanted to. So mm -hmm. then they become, a, you know, the limited player at the end of the game. So, yeah, uh, yeah there's a lot of little, different. like, uh, like interesting things here. But I think you're very right. It is group dependent. Yeah. Uh, you want to have people that just want to have a good time. Because the framework of the game itself is very simple. You know, you're, you are bidding and uh, it's just tokens. It's tokens and it's set collection. The entire game is really based off of what you do, mm -hmm. right? The atmosphere, the environment, the people that you play and kind of how 
it's almost like a meta game in that sense, right? Yeah. So you can have games where you'll go, you'll bid in the hundreds. You can have games where you build, you bid in the trillions. Yeah. It really just depends on the group. So anyway, that is QE. I think that is a very uh, unique uh, type of auction game. It can be kind of dry, I guess, because it's a pretty like bare bones auction game, yeah. but very, very uh, unique concept. It's clever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, that's QE. All right, our last game for today. This is a game that we actually played a couple of times in preparation for a playthrough, mm -hmm. but we hadn't had the time to actually film the playthrough, do the review, and we actually weren't even, uh, we weren't very good at it. We didn't feel confident yeah. because of the factions that it came That's right. with, right? Yeah. This is none other than Root, Root. <laughs> the Marauders expansion. This yes. is the newest expansion to come out uh, in this, this huge world now. Root is this huge, this huge game. Lots of different right? woodland creatures now. Yeah, and new mechanics now too because we also have the hireling box. And I believe this also comes with hirelings. Yes, yes. two new factions and four hirelings mm -hmm. is what comes in this uh, expansion. I believe the four hirelings in this one are the base game hirelings. Mm -hmm. So if you never, if you have no idea what we're talking about, we're going to explain that in a second. But this is the expansion that was kind of um, pitched as being a good one at two. So we were really, really, really looking forward to playing this one. This expansion comes with two new factions. Two. There's the Keepers in Iron mm -hmm. and the Lord of the Hundreds. Lord of the Hundreds, yes. So one of them is really strong. Yeah. And the other one is really hard, right? Yeah, the the Keepers in Iron is, uh, we found to be very difficult. Yes. Um, we, we, Monique and I played this, I think, three times, maybe a little bit more than that. And every time we played with just these two factions just to understand this particular box a little bit better. Yeah. And every time whoever was the the person, uh, the Keepers Lord of the... Keepers in Iron. The Keepers in Iron was struggling to figure out like the best, most efficient route yeah, uh, to, it, to winning the game. That faction just takes some practice. It does, like, You have yeah. to figure it out. The Lord of the Hundreds out of the box already seems apparently strong, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you see it and you're like, oh, I'll do this. And I'm, I'm really aggressive <laughs> being the Lord of the Hundreds. But the Keepers in Iron, it's almost like a play off of the bird faction from the base game. Yes, yeah. Right? Because you do have your, you almost have like your own little system, just like how the birds did. Yep. But it doesn't eerie, break yeah. like the birds do. It's it's a little bit different in that sense, but it's it's kind of hard to get right. Yeah, you're trying to like lay out tokens and then like collect them. Mm -hmm. And then if you like, if you're holding on to them and not scoring them, they, they protect you and they defend you a little bit more. But if, if you're doing that, then you're not scoring them. So like, there's a lot of planning that's going on. It's a lot of puzzling. On the board and a lot of puzzling, yeah. yeah. Like your decisions need to be right yeah. when you play that faction. Mm -hmm. The other thing though, that this expansion introduces are the hirelings. And the hirelings is what they were pitching as uh, would make the two player game a lot better than and say playing with the clockwork expansion mm -hmm. which, which is, we do like which yeah the yeah. clockwork ex expansion is the expansion that includes the bots yeah. so if you play a uh, route at two you can have bots that replace the other factions mm -hmm. the thing that hirelings do though is they are basically these like hired helpers that don't belong to any specific player mm -hmm. so once a, a player gets to a certain point on the scoring track then a hireling is going to come into play and when they come into play, they are now um, going to be doing your bidding for you, essentially. Yep. You can you can u utilize them depending on what that specific hireling does. Yeah, each each faction hireling has a rule set. And mm -hmm. based off of that, you're going to they're going to be in your favor, in your for, control, in your control yeah. or favor for a round or two or maybe a couple of rounds, depending on um, it's kind of like a little bit of a catch up mechanism. The person mm -hmm. who is further behind will be able to utilize them a little bit more. The thing that's clever about them is they will switch hands. So let's say Monique was the first one on this uh, scoring track. She unlocks them. She'll be able to maybe use them for a round or two, and then automatically they become my hirelings. Yes. And it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth. That is the best part yeah. about the hirelings, mm -hmm. because you can, you can you know, be happy about having these people or these uh, you know, woodland critters who mm -hmm. are going to be at your service for a round or two. But if you don't position them properly, they're going to switch hands and now they're in your territory potentially and, they're gonna and turn now on you yeah your opponent is controlling them right right so it is a brilliant mechanic in my opinion it is, i yeah. think for two players yes yeah now you can play root at two without having to use a bot mm -hmm. I, I think that the hirelings were a beautiful thing that they did for the Very game clever, yeah. because we both really like playing the game at two now like we were mentioning the marauder expansion comes with four hirelings so they're going to be the four hirelings that represent the base game factions the hireling box you can use to store the rest of the 
hirelings? Because there there are hirelings for every single faction that's been created, I, I believe. I think so, yes. And we haven't played with them all. Right. We've only played with the base game ones because, like Naveen was mentioning, they all have a specific uh, rule set. So you're going to want to figure out how to strategize using them. Yeah, it adds a lot of content to, to your root mm -hmm. collection. Like, if you're a big root fan, like, this just adds more mechanisms and more just kind of understanding a deeper experience if mm -hmm. you're trying to play at different player counts. Yeah. For me, root, my favorite player count obviously is four, but this is a really, really good addition if you're trying to play it at two. And we're assuming if you play it at three as well. Yeah. And we are both really big root fans. I know mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. I love root so much. But gosh, with all the content that they've come out f with this game, it's our cubby, our root cubby is maxed out. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many, how much more root it can hold. Yeah. But I'm definitely not complaining because I really love what the hirelings brings. The two factions that come in the base in in this expansion, I like the Lord of the Hundreds because of how uh, aggressive they are. They're kind of like this rolling bowling ball yeah. that's kind of going around and, and creating havoc. But I'm still kind of a on the the keepers. Uh, iron. Yeah, I just can't. I can't figure out. We're out. both struggling with that particular yeah. faction. And we haven't mentioned it up until this point, but all of these root games are published by Leader Games and designed by Cole Worley with art by Kyle Farron. So we've been waiting for a long time to talk about these yeah. because these came out a little bit earlier in the year, but uh, the playthrough wasn't coming out, so we figured we should just we talk, should about, talk that. about it. Yep. Well, there you have it. Those are five games that uh, Monique and I have been hoarding and playing over the past yeah. year. <laughs> Uh, so we finally got to talk about them. Uh, we can't obviously we can't do playthroughs of every single thing that mm -hmm. uh, comes in. So uh, we like to do this segment so that we can kind of at least talk about games that we've been playing. Yeah. If you played any of these games that we reviewed today, please let us know your thoughts on them, especially the Marauders expansion. Mm. I'm very curious to hear uh, other people's experience with those specific factions. Yeah, it's been out for a while now, so we're hoping that you yeah. know people have enough experience, especially with that uh, the, the keepers, keepers in iron. iron. I got to know more about that. And for the hirelings, which yes. hirelings are your favorite to use? What combination, now that there are so many factions, what combinations do you like to play with? Please let us know in the comments down below because we'd love to hear about it. Thank you all so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more like this in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.